Three now. Yeah, I can do it in Dutch. <laughs> That's another way to do it. Right. So in this uh, heavy winter, it's starting to die. So did you mean Okay. Good evening. 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 show is about uh, relationship, about being together, and uh, <clears throat> basically this is very close to something I, this is basically my philosophy, and uh, it's through reading in the last three years that uh, I was able to start to express it, to put it down. Uh, my um, direction brought me to psychology and psychiatry, which is basically human behavior or just how people relate to each other. So, although this is a, a, like interaction theory, it's more like my vision of life in general. Um, it's kind of based on the. Um, well, it's, it's kind of, let's say, reflected through writing and uh, through uh, RD line. Uh, Gregory Peterson and Paul Vassali from uh, Palo Alto. Anyway, so <clears throat> basically, what um, I just like basically this has to do with meaning and how we see and how we perceive. And I I start from the roots on the bottoms up, bottoms down. So basically. I, the way I see the relationship is that there's there's things out there, so how I perceive the things out there and how I perceive myself. So that for me is like the basic brick, the basic stone in life. Um, now, from these two covering points, sometimes we are aware of, of how I perceive out there, and like for example, when you drive your car, or when you uh, meet people, when you feel nervous, things like that. And sometimes you're not aware. And for me, that's when people start to talk about faith and destiny, or God, or the devil, or you know, they're just gonna say, "Well, I couldn't do anything about it." So, and it's it's a bit the same thing about how I see myself. How I see myself. Sometimes you're aware, in the way you can say, "Well, my name is Guy." Uh, I was born in Montreal, so I'm French Canadian, things like that. So that can be very stable, but there's also the things you're not aware of. And then what I find is that there's a lot of institutions around to tell us what to think. So you have like religion who gave us a soul, and you have governments who gave us countries to die for. And the way I find generally these, uh, and like the family who gave us structure, um, generally what I find is that these uh, institutions have an approach of having the true truth, and then you are not given a choice to agree or to disagree. Um, they just come at you and they say, this is it, and you know, if you don't agree, if you don't see like us, you must be out of your mind. And that I find is a bit like the legacy of the mental institutions. It's people who just basically don't fit in the uh, institutions, uh, institutional way. So, <clears throat> in that way, when, when I talk to you, I'm also not here to tell you a truth or something like that. I just find that the only way to to pass on information is just just to talk about how I perceive things. So it's not a question of okay, you have religion, you have TV, you have politics, and now you have a key from you who's kind of saying, okay, guys, you know, I found it, I found it. So I just find that the only way that a kind of discussion can happen is by presenting 
whatever you're feeling. So I'm not here to sell you any soap or any uh, to feel better or things like that. Um, so. Awareness, um, self and self-reflection. So when I talk about being aware of some things and then not being aware of things, then I guess I'm looking and um, pushing the limit of what we are aware of and then what we are not aware of. Things that we kind of relegate to fate or that we put at the mercy of institutions and things like that. So for me, awareness and self-reflection is very important. And for me, it's, it's also very important because it bridges the gap between the world out there and the world inside me, ours and myself. Because I don't believe in this separation. For me, this is an artificial state. Uh, and it's, for me, it's true self-awareness that these two can become together. Um, why we are today in this situation, I feel, of how I perceive the world out there and how I perceive myself, I can kind of uh, put it in a way that, like, you know, there's the Big Bang Theory of creation. So, my theory is that uh, one day there was this giant stainless steel holy knife and it just went bang, you know, and just created in two, cut in two. And so we have two halves of the apple. The world out there and the world in there. And since then, like, human nature has been busy cutting things apart still more and more and more. So we've been like repeating and repeating, always cutting things to the point that now we're splitting atoms when we don't split our hairs. We're just busy splitting everything. So this, this duality for me is like one of the basic stones in life. And this duality. I kind of, so there's like the splitting apart, which I kind of associate with the world out there. And then there's the um, bringing together, which is how I see myself. Okay. And this, in a way, I, I see it the most uh, strongly in men and women coming together in the sense of the, the kind of reunification. And I find it funny because they call that procreation or recreation, which for me sounds like beautiful and something very serious, but actually I would change more the word to recreation, which is recreation, which sounds more fun anyway than just kind of procreation. Um, so for me, it's like not only we're stuck with these two halves, but we can't put them back together. Um, Now, these two uh, attitudes, one has been kind of taken over by the uh, scientific mentality, the one who's physically takes apart all the time. So they just go uh, smaller and smaller and smaller. And these are the people, when I give these kind of lectures, or I talk to people, with whom give me most problems because they only believe that there must be one love for everything. While well, I bring the idea that no, there's always this duality, and that the basic stone of life or whatever is always two. You can never go down to one. So they don't like that I present something which is two, because they always want to cut and cut and cut until there's only one left. Um, but these, these, how can I say, these two, this complementarity is not one of uh, it's like one, it's like a 50-50% or more like a hundred, a hundred percent. It's like it's a continuum. Both need to exist, except that um, they, since they are both different, they also have both different sets of rules, if you can call them, or visions. And that's why you cannot define it by the scientific mentality, because it doesn't apply to the same thing. So that's why it's so difficult with this kind of mechanical world to talk about something which by essence 
cannot be described in our terms. But I really see this duality as, as like the starting point. Um, one also reason why it's difficult to talk about it, about these two, this duality, this other world, which has nothing to do with cutting things apart, is that mostly like for the last 400 years, all the vocabulary that was developed, all the words, are developed around mathematics and around cutting things apart. So we don't have the concept to talk about it, but we also don't have the words to talk about it. Because all the words in the dictionary are about um, uh, cutting things apart to smaller and smaller units. I, for me, I think if the, you, know, you take a dictionary and you take away all the words referring to measurements, to qualifi qualification, qualificative and stuff like that, and then you take that away and you put all the Celtic tales and the folkloric tales and all the old wives tales, then that book would become a kind of description of this other half, which is kind of the, what I would describe the emotional or the, the immaterial as opposed to the uh, quantifiable material world. Now what I bring about is, you know, it, it's not my idea, it's my way of, of translating it in today's term, but it's the basic of yin yang symbol of one thing completing the other one. Uh, if I look so far um, how we have progressed, even though there's this, for me, this duality which is not understood, on the materialist world, we kind of develop technology. So, there's some very good things that have been developed, but at the same time, we're very, you know, there's pollution, the planet is getting destroyed, and the threat of, you know, mad, mutually destruction, with all these things. So, it did bring us a lot of progress, but at the same way, close to destruction. And the same way, emotionally or speaking, we did evolve a lot, like we have the Charter of Rights and things like that. But you still have wars, you still have abuse, you still have these power struggles and things like that. So both sides, in a way, since for me I haven't understand, understood the conjugation of the dependence, uh, as, long, as long as they're on, on balance and one working without the other, then there's always this threat of uh, destruction, I think. Uh, now this, this is like, okay, so this is like an introduction of what I see as a base of life, which I you know, if you, like, so there's the world, how I see it out there, which is like the structure, the organization of the world, and how I see myself, which is inside. Now, what is important and what this lecture is about is about relationship, about interaction theory, about that, for me, actually, meaning comes from having these two fluctuating together all the time. And if you only have one, then the fluctuation is not very strong. And I compare it to a man walking on a tight rope with a big stick. Uh, if he is to move his stick very strongly all the time, he's going to fall down, he won't have a balance. But if he is to hold his stick stable, he's also going to fall down. Because he, he can. So what is keeping him up there is actually the fluctuation between movement and non-movement. And it's the same relationship with electricity. Because electricity is not contained in the molecule. Electricity doesn't exist, it's a state of being. So you cannot say this particle contains this amount of electricity. It's just that this particle has the possibility of creating. So electricity is a relationship. And if you break the relationship, there's no more electricity. And I, to bring it more closer to home, it's the same thing for me with personal relationship. You know what happens if one person is in love and the other one is not. So for me, love is the same thing. Love is not something one possess. It's two people, or three or five, or I mean, whatever cultural concept we have here. But everybody has, let's say, the potential to create love, I find. 
but it's again it's a relationship. It's when, like electricity, it's when the togetherness is there. So it's the concept also of that the the sum of its part is more than than what was there in the beginning. And I think for me that's like a crucial point. So that for me meaning comes actually from the fluctuation from out there and in there. And so far history has taken out there, you know, in the last four or five hundred years as a basic as a study of life. Uh, I think in a way, uh, like a thousand years ago when magic was alive, I think magic is about this other side. And it's like there's been this turn over. And what, what for me is, is important is to kind of find again this that it's neither this or that, but it's actually both of them. And it's both of them in relation. That is the, you know, I always, so I always speak about the trial. There's the two things and there's the relation between them. Um, one, uh, yeah, one example of, of this uh, very concrete is I saw on TV when the child just called was uh, overthrown. Um, it's TV, a show about the uh, young children in the uh, Islands. And they were like uh, motionless and with uh, atrophied legs. They were just like basically bodies laying around. It was really, really horrible. And, you know, the story just went on and basically you learn that all these, most of these, all these children basically came from the orphanage. And what happens like the orphanage, they were all basically stacked in beds, one beside the other. And they were never taken down from their bed. And nobody came to touch them and things like that. So basically they grew up and their legs just became atrophied and they couldn't speak. So what do you do when these human beings become adolescents? You just bring them to the asylum because they're just totally dysfunctional. When for me, you, you see something like that, it's so obvious that how they were treated, how they lived, resulted in, in how they formed and how uh, sad the situation they are now. But the scientific mentality is more one when they say, well, they have a disease, or they will go and cut apart, they will go and look in their genes. And that's, again, the same situation with this conception of mental disease or schizophrenia, which I don't say doesn't exist, but which in a big part, the, the scientific mentality will look for a virus, will look for disease, as opposed to try to understand, well, maybe it's something else. Maybe it has to do with relationships. Um, <clears throat> so in this, in this point, then I start to get closer to uh, more concrete about the interaction theories, where basically interaction is a sense of communication, so that they don't take the individual as the source of disease, but they will look, always look at the individual in his context, so that they will always look at relationship and not as one everything separated. Uh, some example is. Uh, <coughs> That, which I find very nice, is then uh, Bert Whistle. He's a, he's a person who studied uh, uh, kinesthetics, which is human movement. And he slowed down movies to one and studied frame by frame movements and things like that. And then he came up with this beautiful statement, which is that we have to see communication as a process in which the interlocutors engage themselves. An individual doesn't communicate, but takes part in the communication. We are not the instigators of the communication, but participants. So basically, you just kind of see this activity as breathing and living, which is interrelatedness. And you just say that we basically are part of it all the time, but we don't, we don't create it. Or another one, Gregory Bateson, a short phrase, which is, we cannot not communicate. Which is true, I mean, somebody just stays quiet, well, you know, he's staying quiet. I mean, 
there's, there's always seed seeding going on all the time. Uh, isn't it, in that sense, how communication is important? Like a prisoner's worst fear is to be put in the isolation box, to be put away. And that, and then I find that so kind of crazy because isn't that the same we do to uh, a crazy person in an asylum when we put it alone in a white family cell? You know, are we helping him getting better or are we actually driving him crazy by putting him totally alone? Or, I mean, this is so, this need for voice, this need for communication that, I mean, on, on the eve of, of the uh, two year of the University in Montreal, it's the same thing, or McDonald's. I mean, how often do you see like the person just had to reach out, just had to scream, just had to, you know, just to to be, to be able to communicate. Or I mean, even if you look inside, it's like a, like one of the worst fears is just to wake up one morning and to see, and to think that nobody can see you, nobody can hear you, nobody knows you're there, but you become like a ghost. I mean, and that's how communication is. This interrelated is, is, is like this part of who we are, but it's because we never see it because we're always in it. We don't. It's very hard to see. It's a very hard to act, to extract it, or so to abstract it. Um, it's a kind of medium of life where the total is more than the sum of its parts. Um, for me, the scientific attitude has. And that's one of uh, my favorite expression that we see people as individual body bags of flesh who are inhabited by, uh, by a soul and we're just floating around in empty space. That's, that's for me, that's how scientific mind has been treating us. And the problem with that is that not only do they, they see everything as a separate thing, but by cutting everything apart and apart, then they're making less chance for the whole to happen again because they're just pushing and just keeping everything apart. Um, but I also have my, let's say, beef also against this spiritual, emotional attitude. You know, in the sense that I found like true um, either religion or spirituality or even philosophy, they have taken us away from the material world. In a way that they, they make it, you know, some will speak a bit about something of duty or something dirty or something to be simply avoided. And what I find funny is that most often all these thinkers and talkers are more busy with us after our death than while we are alive. You know, and that's what I call having lost touch with reality. Um, so my understanding of communication is, is like the, it's not like just something between the two, it's like it's the essence, and it's the, the uh, come and go between these, how I perceive myself and how I perceive the world out there. So it's not just like a coming up together, but it's actually the togetherness of it and the exchange of it that actually creates meaning, that actually creates love or warmth. And this, I find, in re I return, like I didn't read much, but in one book I came across this uh, Wittgenstein uh, saying, which is the meaning is the use, you know, which is, is just that. Or Bateson who said, anything should be defined not by what it is in itself, but by its relation to other things. So again, the the type of artist is the same thing. It's what keeps him alive is the what he's doing, is the motion, and not the one state or the other. It's actually the motion of it, the back and forth. Um, now to get closer to, uh, in a way, how I came to concentrate on this way of thinking is to talk more directly about these. Uh, people I've mentioned. And I think if uh, <clears throat> the fields of uh, anthropology and sociology and psychiatry were kind of the first to go into communication theory, it's because they, they start to look at where it doesn't work. You know, and, and that I find is 
often sad that we have to wait like something breaks before we can actually fix it or make it better, like pollution and stuff like that. So, in that way, anthropology has had to deal with a culture different from theirs. So it didn't start from the notion that there was only one culture, but they asked this from the notion that they were different. So then they got interested into the differentness. And the same thing with the non-integrated individuals, people who just didn't fit in society. I mean, where did they come from? Why is this happening? Um, uh, one and what is interesting is, and that was Bateson. Bateson worked in the 20s and in the 30s with, uh, he married Mar Margaret May, who also became quite famous, until she had the uh, scandal in the 60s. But nevertheless, they, they were together like for 20, 25 years in Bali, mostly, I think. And so he was really in the field. And so it's, it's, I don't know, it's later in life that he turned, that Bateson turned into psychiatry and anthropology. And in the end, he was just into basically everything. Just basically created his own field, you could say. So for these people, it took a big, uh, step to actually change the concept of it had to restructure like from the concept of the individual as existing to and as Bateson said that to see the individual more well as words say it's better identity is not independent of the social matrix in which a person operates it is usually defined by the culture in which a person lives so that this was like with the statements, like the opening to saying that, uh, well, you just don't exist out there by yourself and you have your own private identity. But that your identity, you know, it's the beginning to say it's partly defined by your culture, by where you live, by, by the context in which you are. Um, the relationship between the, the, the individual and, and the environment, the context, the world out there. Uh, was is brought a bit more forward with uh, Paul Watzlaw, who worked in California in the 60s, 70s. And it just gives this very simple example that if in, in a hospital ward uh, emergency, they bring a man who's unconscious and they make you know, hundreds of studies and they just cannot figure out what's wrong with him. And then finally they learned that this guy was in an airplane and the airplane just kind of, I don't know, his parachute fell down and stuff like that, but he had this basic big change of altitude. So that his bodily pressure just changed and he couldn't handle it and that's why he passed out. Then everything becomes understandable. But because they didn't know the context or the environment, then what happened is that they, you can give a lot of explanations to what is in front of you, which can be totally false and totally wrong. Um, failure to realize the intricacies of relationships between an event and the matrix in which it takes place either confronts the observer with something mysterious or induces him to attribute to his objects of study certain properties the object may not possess. So he's just saying, well, you have to look at the context. You cannot just take something outside of this context. You have to look at it as a whole. Uh, and I find in all, all these different people are kind of summarized with another statement by Matlabik, which is so it's very simple. It's like, instead of asking, why is this person behaving in this bizarre, irrational manner, it is better to ask, in what human context would this behavior be the best possible? Perhaps the only possible one. So instead of saying, this person is sick, they say, well, maybe this person is not sick, but maybe it's just kind of, you know, the context. He has to be like that to fit in this context. So let's, let's um, try to understand where he comes from, what's happening with him. Beethoven at his state in that point that the this, this schizophrenic must live in a universe where the sequence of events are such that his unconventional communicational habits 
will be in some sense appropriate. So in a way there's a loosening up of, of calling these people crazy, but saying actually maybe they're just like as intelligent and as strong as we are, except they live they are in a different context somehow. And the, then the quest is to try to understand this context, to try to understand their language. And language is a, a major stone, and language is basically about communication. Um, the uh, Lang, in this approach, although he's not really interactionist, but uh, he deals a lot, he, I think, I don't know if he's the one who basically invented family therapy, but if not, he was one of the first one to really popularize it. So that instead of have just studying the patient alone, he would do the whole family. And then he would, and it's very interesting when you read them when like, you have the identified patient, that's one way you call the, the, the person, and then you see him along with the father, and then with the father and the mother, and then the father, the mother, the sister. And that all this, all these different things, different relationships, different things will be said at that point. Um, Lang says that every relationship implies a definition of self by other and other by self. So Lang really goes directly and says who you are is directly determined by how you see the other people around you and who are the people around you. So his way of, of trying to reach the person who cannot integrate the, the, the context in which he is, is, is says that it's the attempt to reconstruct the patient's way of being himself in his, in his world, along with the patient's way of being with me. So through being together with him, he just trying to get a, a, an inside look into what context is the person living in. Uh, again, if we go to language, and like I say, that the interactional approach views mental disorder as a socially engendered situation. So as a so not as a person, but as a so from the social environment. As opposed to a disease one possesses. Their therapy is based on decoding the language of the schizophrenic by identifying the context in which it finds itself. This, and what's nice about these guys is that they set as a priority an understanding and a resolution of the situation as opposed to, you know, filling the person with drug or with electroshocks. You know, one, the, the old well, part of psychiatry was about just to control and they set out to just kind of resolve it, or to integrate it once and for all. But this thing, so this, their perception of language it is like what Levick says that crazy communication or behavior is not necessarily the manifestation of a sick mind, but may be the only possible reaction to an, to an absurd or untenable communication context. About dialogue, Lang also says to regard the dialogue of some schizophrenic as due to some psychological deficit is rather and this I really love an example. It's rather like supposing that a man doing a handstand on a bicycle on a tightrope a hundred feet up in the air with no safety net is suffering from an inability to stand on his own two feet. You know, that, that I find is very beautiful. Um, another vision of, of from interaction theory or the relations between the people and the context is Thomas Zass, which I find is a beautiful writer. He's kind of very controversial. And because he wrote books like The Myths of Mental Illness, The Myths of Psychotherapy, and he really basically relates um, politi the political implications of mental disorder. And he basically qualifies like mental illness as a creation of a political society in the same way as the witch hunts centuries ago. Uh, he considers the language of the hysterics like French compared to English. You just have to ask yourself 
how did this person live, learn this language? And what does it mean? In the same way that very bit with the dreams. So you don't, the thing is that you don't take it literally. You just kind of try to see what is the alphabet, what is the language, what, what does it relate to? Um, in regards to his patient condition, he has, uh, and that's a bit the catch-22, it's like, when I explain it like that, it seems like, well, then the guy, you know, why is he doing that? Why is he not better? Like, why is he not talking normal language? Why does he have to go into his own world? And that is really then that's where it's a catch-22 situation. Because the hysteric cannot afford to be aware of what he's doing. Because if he were, he could no longer do it. He cannot afford to tell himself the truth. But he also cannot afford to know that he is lying. Lying in reflection to this, basically see language as a barrier. You know, so it's just like communication as like a medium of life then to block communication is one way to protect uh, himself by setting up this barrier he says the act the act is what can be said of it but the schizoid must never be what can be said of it he must remain always ungraspable, elusive, transcendent if he were what this act was then he would be helpless and at the mercy of any passerby so to, in a way, there's this development of another language, another world, but at the same time that it's developed, it also has to be unconsciously brought up, because if not, it can always be decoded. So that's, it's, it's a protection. So that comes from the concept of language, then, which is communication, from the concept of integration, communication. Uh, in this way, uh, Peterson wrote, people are mentally healthy only when their means of communication permits them to manage their surroundings successfully. So, somebody who's, who's basically healthy is when he can basically function in what happens around him. And when he cannot function, then that's when he defines as mentally unhealthy. Um, the concept of integration, or lack of integration, plays a central role in this theory because behavior is consequent to the context in which it finds itself. Um, now, if, if I kind of concentrate on the individual, now I can a bit talk just very fast about integrate to what? Integrate to the world out there, in a way. Um, now, out there, uh, according to this person, Yusuf Al-Sheri, who wrote a book called The Psychology of Social Norms, um, very basically he just says, wherever there exists any enduring human grouping, we find a system of customs, values, laws, and standards that regulate the relationship of the individuals to one another and the life activities in which they engage. So when, as soon as you have a group, then there will be rules and laws to which the individual has to uh, fit, to integrate, conform. Yeah. So another interesting writer is uh, Edward T. Hall, who wrote uh, The Silent Language, The Hidden Dimension. Um, he basically did a study about uh, the difference between cultures in, in the everyday life behaviors and then just kind of compare them between Japan and America and England. Um, he calls these rules, um, these regulators, patterns, and he defines them as patterns are those implicit cultural rules by means of which sets of, of meaning are arranged so that they take on the meaning. Yet, Man, as a cultural being, is bound by hidden rules, and he is bound as long as he remains ignorant of the nature of the hidden pathways cultures provide for him. And that brings me point to this point of awareness, that as long as you're not, if you're not aware, then you will be bound by these pathways, by culture, 
and through awareness, then you can become aware of these uh, things you are called to integrate. Uh, example, you say, when you are attracted, like in courting, like in sex, uh, the feelings you have are, are yours, but what you are going to say, what you are going to wear, where you are going to meet, and what you are going to do, these are all defined by culture. So half of it is yours, but for the major, how it's going to be expressed, that's all culturally defined. Uh, this, this misconception, or you know, what people call fate, destiny, or human nature, I find is often in the, in the garbage pile of human activity, but it's not my fault, it's human nature. Uh, Vedasen calls this the, uh, the misunderstanding of the misconception of this pattern. He has a very nice law, but I'm not sure. His, his view of culture is as an ongoing message which has basically lost sight of its original sender. When participating in a cultural network, people are in many cases unaware of being the receivers and senders of message, messages. Rather, the messages, culture, seems to be an unstated description of their way of living. They attribute it no, no human or origin, but they themselves transmit the message to others by living in accordance with its content, which they may regard as human nature. So, what I find interesting, what he brings, this concept of uh, that culture is basically a communication or is a language, but that is basically so stretched out that when you're stuck in the middle, you, you don't know the beginning and you don't know the end. So you, you will see it as a thing existing in itself, but it's actually just an ongoing set of rules which change over the generation. Uh, moving from society to the family, which is basically what this show is about, uh, Antonio Ferrer, who worked with the uh, land that the family myth or the family culture structure is a series of fairly well integrated beliefs shared by all family members concerning each other and their mutual position in the family life. Beliefs that go unchallenged by everyone involved in spite of the reality distortions which they make conspicuously imply. Um, basically as that the behavior of every individual within the family is related to and dependent upon the behavior of all others. All behavior is communication and therefore influences and is influenced by others. So there's this, this slowly build up of not only interdependence but interdefinition or interlocking so that we're, not, we're no longer just an individual in a group but that Basically, how you act, how you think, not only is culturally defined as a starting point, but it's also dependent on what your family has decided by itself as its own mini culture. Like Lane adds to this, the family romance is a dream of changing the others who define the self, so that the identity of the self can be self defined by a redefinition of the others. So you're basically trying to change everybody around you so that we can tell you what you think you should be and think. That's one way of how it gets uh, distorted. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, that just lost the turn in my head. Oh, you can move on. Do you, I mean, do you want to keep going? Who oh, you know, sure. wrote the uh, presentation of the self in everyday life, who basically take as a basic unit the group, so he doesn't even study the individual anymore. Like it's this basic uh, unit in life is the group. And uh, what does he say? He says, uh, Things as a basic unit to group 
and not the individual, and describe our action as performances towards an audience. He writes, the object of a performer is to sustain a particular definition of the situation. This representing his claim to reality. And then he says, a performer may be taken by his own act, convinced at the moment that the impression of reality which he fosters is the one and only reality. At that point, the performer comes to be his own audience and incorporates the standards he attempts to maintain in the presence of others. And that's a bit, I think, I read like one page of Sa in my life, I think, and the first page of Dan Jose, I think, I don't know. And just at one point, there's this thing, like he says, there's the waiter, mostly in a French uh, cafe, that you see here. He says, the, the waiter is actually playing the waiter. He has become a caricature himself, but he doesn't even know that himself. He just, he's taken his role and he has made a role of his role. Uh, yeah? Well, I have for not so long. So, Lang talking about uh, the family says, uh, well, let's say that as an integral, integral part of who we are. So like that. Uh, now, just to kind of, this is the, the last part, which is basically, okay, so that's, this is the, the starting point was that we have these two, uh, this duality, the world out there and the world inside myself. And slowly I define that, uh, the world out there is kind of all made up of all these rules and things like that, and that we are called to conform to all these rules, and that when confirmation, uh, conformation happens, then there's integration, and then when it doesn't, there's no integration, and that's when you get problems. Um, the what's interesting about attraction the theory is that they will deal uh, with the here and now. They don't, they're not so much interested about your past as other psychiatrists. It's like the uh, Paul Vassalik and his group basically started the systems theory. Um, the system view offers an exploration of the parameters of the systems, the rules and limitations observed in an ongoing interaction which can account for both perpetuation and change in the system, the here and now the situation. In a theory of systems, cause and effects are no longer relevant because the system is defined by the nature of the process or the system parameters. So basically, instead of looking in the person's past as an isolated thing, you say, well, today, where do you find yourself? We let's look at the context in which you exist, and from the context we can see how things function, and then we change in the present. So there's no need to go look into the past, because it has to do with interrelationship. Um, the one way he parallels it is like with a row as a system. The fibers forming a row are all independent parts, but when you put them together by twisting, the weave transform them into one continuous body, the rope. The weave is not made of fibers, but if you take away the weave, then the fibers will appear. Thus the fibers plus the weave, the context, creates the rope. The context is not an environment, but it's what is actually bringing everything and holding everything together. And this idea of duality was basically very strongly summarized by McLuhan, he said the medium is the message. So that there's, uh, there's not only the thing, but the thing in itself is a duality, and together they create the meaning. 
the separation of the content from the action which manipulates it diminishes the importance of content and the meaning of the action and gives the act itself also its role in the makeup. In a relationship, each participant seeks in every communication to determine the nature of the relationship. Similarly, each responds with its definition of the relationship, which may confirm, reject, or modify the other. So there's not only what you talk about, but also how you talk. And how you talk will determine who, how this, you know, you won't talk the same to your mother as you would talk to a father. Although you may have the same subject, but how you will move, how you will feel, how open you will be, is kind of establishing the relationship. Sas kind of makes, calls this the object seeking of communication. All communication behavior has, among other functions, the aim of making contact with another human being. We call this the object seeking and relationship maintaining function of language. Um, the, you know, and this, this becomes so obvious because we kind of assume that what you say is what is the most important thing when you talk to somebody. But actually it's not. It's because that's half. The other half, and that's become obvious with chit chat, you know, or when you're, uh, I don't know, you're in your family and then you're just talking very safe. So, it, uh, because at one point it doesn't matter what you say anymore. Or when your parents, your mom, would say, well, uh, drive safely now, or be sure to dress warmly, as if, you know, you were not able to dress warmly, but the point of her saying that is restating her relationship, I am your mother, you are my child. Um, Bateson states it very directly by saying that every communication, every message has to unit the report which conveys the information and the command which refers how to react to it. The command is rarely deliberate or aware and the more healthy the relationship, the more it is spontaneous and in the background. And the more sick is the relationship, the more it is predominant and the content less and less important. And that's basically schizophrenic thought, where the content is not important anymore. But what is important is to actually break up any chance of communication, where the action basically has taken over the passing on of the message. Thus, in the interactional view, mental health is equivalent to a corresponding balance between how a person acts and, and the environment in which he acts, or how he perceives himself and how he perceives the world surrounding him. A good balance will see him acting in concordance with his environment. So, why, and this, this is the last part, why do how do people get into situation of non-communication? Why does this happen? Why are we stuck with disease as we become to people? Uh, Václavik defines it by this confirmation, blame to mystification and Beethoven to double, uh, double mind, which is basically be summarized in not being allowed to acknowledge your own experience. Not, so it's just basically cutting apart these two things. Uh, Watnavik says that in any discussion there's three things that can happen. There's, you can either confirmation, saying yes, rejection, saying no, or disconfirmation. And disconfirmation basically means you do not exist. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and this is what, according to him, uh, destroy or breaks down this myself inside and the world out there if you're being punished for correct perception of the outside world. So like an alcoholic father who will say to you, I'm a nice person and then beats you. So you, inside you feel something and outside there's something else, but the outside is telling you that what you're seeing and what you're living is not there. So you don't you know, you are, you are expected to have other feelings than those you are actually experiencing. 
or a phrase that demands and prohibits the same thing at the same time, double standards, like do what I say, not what I would like you to do, or you should always win, fair or foul, but be honest, or be happy, or be spontaneous, things, you know, self-reflective statements. Uh, Lang, when he talks about mystification, is the denial of identity. And when he saw patients in group therapy, often what would happen is that, you know, if a patient would say something, then the parent was the judge of what the patient recognized. The parent would say what she really wanted, what she really thought, what was for her own good, what was a change or what was not a change, what was possible. Or the parent would invalidate what the patient would say with, oh, she does not really mean what she says. She is saying this because she is ill. She cannot remember or know what she feels or felt. Or she's not justified in saying this. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm And Bateson's double bind is basically, he described double bind as a statement that, a statement made within a clearly defined frame of reference that asserted something about this frame and therefore about itself. This, well, yeah, basically he says it's this a statement, it's a statement about itself and at the same time you're not allowed to comment about it at the same time. So basically, again, if you take the drug and father, it hits you and then he says, be nice. And then you're not even allowed to say what you don't make sense. So you're not even allowed to say anything. So then uh, the interactional view not only identifies that it is not allowed to express one's perception of the world, and the self, which suppresses the chance for growth and identity, but also that an awareness, and I think that's where the hurt comes from, that an awareness of this dilemma is also taken away. It isn't surprising that a person cut in such a bind can only resort to exclude himself from the contact of interchange. His last chance is to cut himself from the, sy from the system, which taught him to regard, yeah, in five minutes. Um, we'll 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 so basically, because he cannot even evaluate outside, because outside uh, is getting unwritten information, and he cannot accept what is happening inside him, um, because he is told not to feel, and at the same time, he is not even allowed to comment on what is, what is going through, then his only solution is basically just to cut himself from any communication. Um, this, uh, for me, this this just kind of introduction or to a bit to psychiatry and this this feel of of uh, this state this of this duality is to take away from uh, this disease mind or so this materialistic attitude of cutting everything apart and that try always to find the disease in the thing itself. And for me, this uh, psychiatric uh, direction of looking at the person in relation to the environment, so for me, kind of reflected this, this duality of having an awareness of yourself and having an awareness of outside. And that when these two are coordinated, then you do find meaning and then you can function. And because these people are the 
people cannot function, then they become basically the, the uh, example of what, uh, how much communication, how much exchange, how much perception uh, is uh, an essential part, and how if you don't have it, the only way a person can survive is by totally closing himself up. So he still keeps a relation to the outside world, but the, the, it's a relation where there's no communication. That's his solution. So it's not, it doesn't mean he's stupid, it just means that the only way to survive, the only way to keep on communicating is by not communicating, which for me just kind of, again, uh, underline how important this interconnectedness between these two realities, like even in the extreme, it still has to be there, it still has to, even if it's totally blocked, as opposed to just disappearing and just killing yourself. In closing about this <coughs> awareness about the world out there and the world in here, and how it's the relation between these two which creates meaning or which destroys meaning. Um, I'll just quote from uh, La Wuxi, the long uh, quote, which is 30 spokes are made one by holes in the hub, by vac vacancies turning them for a wheel's use. The use of clay in molding pitches comes from the hollow of the tapsas. Doors, windows, and the house are used for their emptiness. Thus, we are helped by what is not to use what is. Thank you.